in the book of Revelation, and we are in chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, again, we are beginning to open the seals of the book of Revelation. All right, and these seals are not confined to the book of Revelation. These seals have a direct impact upon the people of God at a particular time when we look at this uh, these seals in the book of Revelation, but also we're going to find that there was that that God has a record of every generation, and God is specifically speaking in this particular context to the to the to the church from the time of Christ to the end time. Remember, we said when we started in the book of Revelation, when God was speaking to John, He says, "Write." For the time is at hand. The things that he was writing, they were happening in his time. Now, all of the things that he wrote, he would not live to see them fulfilled. But he wrote them, as Peter said, as referring to the patriarchs and the prophets. He says that they studied and they inquired and they searched diligently the things that were reported, the things that are being reported unto you now, he says, but they ministered unto us, not unto them. So prophets generally would write more for the future than for their own time. They was experiencing these things that they were going through, but what they were writing, it would always be for the generations to come. When Moses was writing the book of the law, it wasn't necessarily for his time there in the wilderness. He says, but this was to be here as a witness against you as you were to go into the promised land. Moses had already understood that he was not to go over. But what God had given him would be a guiding light to the people of God as they would go out into the world to accomplish the purpose that God had raised them up for. When the children of Israel was in the wilderness, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis 17, when God was giving the, the prophecy concerning Christ, but, but specifically he's talking about Isaac in the literal, but Christ in the future, and he gave him the sign of circumcision. And in Acts 17, we find that uh, uh, Abraham circumcised all of his household, all the men of his household. And he was told there that whosoever was not circumcised would be cut off from the covenant. Well, the children of Israel, their whole time in the wilderness, there was no circumcision. Right before they were about to go over, God reinstituted circumcision. And the Bible says that the, 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 the burden or the, the, uh, um, um, the reproach of Egypt was rolled off of them. So the generation that died in the wilderness... And then that new generation that came up, they were not circumcised. But they were again circumcised as they were preparing to go into Canaan. There was a numbering of the people once again as they prepared to go into Canaan. And so, brothers and sisters, as you and I are on the banks of the Jordan, as we are nearing that time... God is going to reinstitute his covenant with his people. There is going to be a numbering of the people. In other words, there's going to be a shaking that will take place. And then God is going to, as it were, number his people again. And those that go over will be those who have entered into this covenant with God. Not based upon the fact that their fathers and their mothers were in, the, in a particular church. Not based upon the fact that, 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 that I was born into something. Because you can be, have been born into this church and not yet entered into a covenant with God. And so you're a part of the church, but you have not been set apart. You're a part of the physical church. Your name is on the church books, but it is not registered in heaven. Because we must understand, brothers and sisters, that God is not going to take the books of heaven and try to make them match the books on earth. 
He's not, they're not, he's not trying to come up with a correspondence that says, well, I have so-and-so in my book. Um, well, he's not in here. Is he? Is he? Okay, well, I'll put him in. I, I, uh, excuse me. And if, no, that's not going to happen. So the books of heaven doesn't correspond with the books of the earth. Because Simon Magus was baptized into the physical church in the book of Acts chapter 8. But when Peter came, Peter says that, man, you're still in the bond of iniquity. So the name was not registered in heaven. And so the reality is that God in this generation that we're living is seeking to renew his covenant with us. He is seeking to distinguish and things are transpiring in this world that is dividing between those who are not serving God versus those who are. Because if we allow everything around us to fade to black and we just look at ourselves individually, we will have no excuse for not being faithful to Christ. And so what, what, but, but we often, humanity does, is we look for some reason why we are not doing what we ought to be doing. We look for some excuse, something to somewhat say, well, you're not here because of this. And so what happens is we try to make the world the, the, the scapegoat for our unfaithfulness. And the reality is our relation with God must be determined upon our own surrender and our own faithfulness. Because the church is dealing with what the church is dealing with is because the church's unfaithfulness. This is why when Jesus came to the church, you notice that Christ spent no time talking about Tiberius Caesar. He wasn't talking about Herod. He wasn't talking about Pilate. He wasn't talking about nothing that was going on in society that if you were to go back and look at history that tells you society was depraved in every way. But Jesus was talking to his people. Right. And, he, and, and he was telling them that the reason why things are happening the way they are is because the light has been put under a bushel. You have severed yourself from God by your worldly associations. And so he spent his time speaking to the church. He spent his time helping them to understand that the world can be affected only by your connection to heaven. And so what we find as we're looking in the book of Revelation, as God is beginning to open these seals, what God is about to do, what God does in this scene of the seals is God takes John's mind from the earth and he fastens it upon heaven. Just as he did when he opened, when he began to show him what was happening in the churches. He helped John to recognize that what is happening on the earth, and yes, you will see this, this apostasy taking place and this falling away and this persecution, but don't forget that who holds the seven stars in their right hand. And so while John is dealing with things that's happening upon the earth, John's mind still recognizes that behind the scenes, God is still in control. Amen. And so what God is about to show John as he begins to open these seals, and when John begins to see these things, again, it's, it's, it, it is almost disheartening to him, but John's eyes will be fastened and realize and, and, and will see what is happening in heaven. And so though it looks discouraging, his mind still realizes that God is in control and that the church must continue to go forth under God's command. Now notice, brothers and sisters, here we are in Revelation chapter 4. John has gone through the seven churches. And he has showed John what was to transpire all the way to the end of time. He brings John to the judgment. And then all of a sudden, after this, John, that vision passes. John meditates upon it. He reflects upon it. And then all of a sudden, we find John being caught up in the spirit once again to see things because God still has more to reveal to his servant for you and I in the last days. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 4. 
Revelation, the fourth chapter, and we're going to read all 11 verses. Amen. Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter four, verse one, reading down to verse 11, and then we'll go back and we'll begin to look at this. Now, Revelation four and five is one scene. Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 5 is one scene. The seals go from chapter 4 all the way to Revelation chapter 8 verse 1. All right, the seals go from what chapter? Four. Revelation 4 all the way to what? Chapter 8 verse, one. Chapter eight, verse one. 1. And it's very important to understand that. Notice, Revelation 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, After this, I looked... And behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, what? Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set up in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in, the, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed, in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lamps of fire burning where before the throne which are the seven spirits of God verse 7 verse 6 part of me and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind verse seven and the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf and the third beast had the face of a as a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them, had each of them what? Six wings, Six wings <clears throat> about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest night, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God. Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast what and for thy pleasure they are and were what all right now let's go into chapter 5 now let's go into chapter 5 because we want to make a point and I want you to get the right answer. Chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. So in chapter 4, there's a throne and there's activity around the throne. There's someone sitting upon the throne, Right? And so now, here in chapter 5, it says that the person sitting upon the throne had in his book a, had a book, had, his, had, a, had a book in his hand, in his right hand, that sat upon the throne, and it had, and it was sealed with seven seals. Verse 2, 
And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the heaven, neither under the earth was able to do on, open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept, John says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to do what? Look thereon. Now consider something. Was John here in heaven? Come on now. Was John here in heaven? He's in vision, right? John is seeing this. John is hearing this proclamation being made in heaven. John hears that there's a book and there's something in this book that is sealed and yet an angel comes not to boast, not to make people feel belittled, but he's trying to bring attention and awareness to how important this book is. And he simply says, is there anybody worthy to open the book? And so John naturally is waiting and he looks around and he hears, wow, no one is able to open it. It's as, it's as if no one even makes a move to open it. And John is here in vision and he's wondering, why is can no one open a book? And the Bible says he begins to weep. He begins to cry because he knows that there's something of importance. It's almost like it's this, this sense of impression is upon his mind that something in that book is important that involves that, 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 that we need to understand. And I can't see it. Notice what it goes on to say. So after he wept, and then it says in verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, said unto me, Do what? Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Verse 7. And he came. Who is the him? Context. No, 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 no. That's not what it said. That's not what it said. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, we, we, we were going to get there. But again, keep in your mind, imagine you're talking to someone who has never heard it. So what you said is correct because you could prove that, that the lamb is Jesus. And you could prove that he came from the tribe of Judah. But as we're reading through it, again, as you're making the simple connections, and then you're going to go from simple to more complex. So it says, and he came, and the he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Notice, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that did what? Sat upon the throne. Now, I wanted us to go there for this purpose. Because when we go back to chapter 4, we need to find out who is that sitting upon the throne in chapter 4. And so as you read into chapter 5, you can now distinguish. Because naturally, someone read that, and they may, you may make the assumption, and, and your assumption may be correct, but you want to have the assurance that this is who you're speaking of. Are we together? Yes. Now, notice this term is going to be used again. Notice what your Bible says in Revelation chapter 6. Go to Revelation chapter 6, and let's look at verse, um, let's look at verse 14. Let's look at verse 14, reading down to verse 16. Revelation 6, 14, down to verse 16. This combination of the one sitting upon the throne and the lamb is going to be used again. Notice what it says. Revelation 6, verse 14, the Bible says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, verse 16, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us, notice, from the face of 
him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Notice what your Bible says in the book of, now keep your marker in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. But go in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And notice what the Bible tells us in verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 16 only in this context. Notice. Him that sitteth upon the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. Now, we know who the Lamb is, amen? amen. John 1, Behold the Lamb. Lamb of God that taketh away the Amen. sin of the world, right? We know the tribe of that Christ came out of the tribe of Judah. It tells us that in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 4, that if he was on earth, Christ would not be a priest. <clears throat> and he talked about how Christ came out of Judah, also in Hebrews chapter 7. Notice, the Bible tells us here, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, when you have it, amen. amen. Notice now, the Bible says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. So now, with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the ark angel so we we notice notice what your bible says in the book of john chapter 5 go with me in your bible to the book of john chapter 5 the dead in christ is going to rise at the voice of the what ark angel amen notice what it says in john the fifth chapter john chapter 5 so the lord himself is also coming with this voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. John 5, John 5, the Bible says in verse 25. John 5 and verse 25, you there? The Bible says this. It says, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of what? Son of God. Son of God and they that hear shall live. So the Lord himself is coming with Christ. Are we together? Notice, the Bible says, let's go in our Bibles now to the book of Acts. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts, the second chapter. Here is Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, referring to Christ in glory. Referring to the events that were transpiring on that very day. And notice what he says as it relates to Christ. The Bible tells us here in the book of Acts, the second chapter. And let's begin at verse 30. <clears throat> verse 30, right? Um, backing, well, we're starting at verse 30, but previous to this, it talks about Christ not seeing corruption. Uh, he's referring to Psalm 16 when David talked about how the Holy One would not see corruption. And then he says that, that he would be resurrected and the Lord, he would uh, uh, be in the presence of the Lord and pleasures forevermore. And then notice what he says. And then he says, men and brethren, that David is dead and buried. But being a prophet, in verse 30, but therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Seeing he, pardon me, seeing this before, spake of the one resurrection of Christ. That his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see what? This Jesus hath God raised up. Whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, verse 33, therefore being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but saith himself, 
the Lord said unto my, sit thou where? On my right hand. So when we're talking about in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, remember what the disciples accepted by faith. God is now showing them in reality. They preach this as though they saw it. They were assured of it by the word of God. Remember what Peter said in 2 Peter. He said, when we told you about the coming of the Lord, he said, we wouldn't follow no cunningly devised fables when we made known this unto you. He says, but you have a more sure word of prophecy that you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. So Peter says, we saw it. We saw the excellent glory. We heard God speak. He said, but you have something more sure than what we heard and what we saw. You have the word of God, which he goes on to say, did not come by the will of man, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by, by the Holy Spirit. And so this is the scene that John is seeing in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is something that they were preaching. They were preaching this as though they saw it. Now, when Stephen was stoned, Stephen saw it. Stephen said, I see the Lord standing on the right hand. He saw it. And so what happens is John is now being taken back to that introduction. He's been taken back to Christ being ushered in, as it were, into this scene of his inauguration. Now notice, brothers and sisters, I want you to notice, the Bible tells us something. Matter of fact, let's go back. Let's go back to Revelation 4. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 4. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 4. Because oftentimes, oftentimes, when we consider and talk about the plan of salvation, the Father unconsciously is excluded. Now, I don't know if that, that is something that generally happens, but fathers tend to be excluded a lot of times. But the reality of it is, when we're talking about the plan of salvation, generally, we talk about Christ. Amen? Amen. And all, and all praise is due to Christ. But unconsciously, sometimes the Father is often set aside as the stern judge. You know, yes, Christ comes to save us, but the Father's sitting there with his hands folded. But the reality is, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he did what? Gave his only begotten son. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So it's, 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 it's Christ, and yet we see the Father. Remember when Philip said, show us the Father. And he said, man, how long have I been with you? If you have seen me, you have seen what? The Father. The Father. Now, Christ was not saying he is the Father. Amen? That's not what he was saying. But if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Paul says in the book of Hebrews, he says Christ is the express image of the Father. And so what happens is this is, this is John seeing this revelation, this, 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 uh, um, this covenant between the two of them. Zechariah mentions this, there's a covenant that is between Christ and the Father. And the covenant between them was our salvation. The covenant that was made to save you and I. Peter says that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the earth. John sees it in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 when he says the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So the covenant between the Father and the Son was our salvation. And this is what John is looking upon. This is what John is being privileged to peer into. And guess what? This is the conversation. And this is the conversation and the, 
the, the oneness that God has given you and I, the privilege and also the responsibility. Because once we see it, God wants us to tell it. God wants us to show this covenant. Remember, when Christ sent out the disciples to preach, one thing, if you, if you study the prayer that is prayed in John 17, Christ is praying that the oneness between him and his father would be demonstrated with his disciples. This same oneness, Lord, that you and I have had since the beginning of time, we want, that. Lord, I want this same oneness to be seen with them. Just as we are one, they're one. And he not only prays for those whom they would immediately preach to, but then he comes back and says, Lord, I, I pray not for these alone, but for everyone that believes on me because of them. So that prayer takes in generations who would accept the gospel by the preaching of the word of God. That this oneness. And so now, in order for us to understand this oneness, God gives us his word. Because as we're going to go, as you go further through the book of Revelation, there's always a term that, that is associated with Christ. Which is, which was, and which is to come. Which is simply saying that I'm the same today, yesterday, and forever. But the reason why he, he's so emphatic with showing us this is because when we get in the book of Revelation, the beast is going to be called which was, which is, and which is to come. This beast will take on the characteristics and try to assume the place of God in heaven. And this is what the Bible calls blasphemy. And so this is why God is emphatic with showing us that this is something that belongs to Christ. This is something that belongs in heaven. And God says in the book of Isaiah that I will not give my glory to another. But this power will assume this glory of its own. And that's why Paul says in the book of Thessalonians that this power will sit in the seat of God and will show himself that he is. And he will command worship. And this is why the Bible says that when we worship the beast, we're actually worshiping the dragon, which is Satan. And many are doing this ignorantly. They are worshiping what they think they're worshiping man. They think that they are worshiping saints. But they are actually, brothers and sisters, they are worshiping Satan himself. This is who is inspiring them. And this is why God has given us a gospel that we can not only preach something by, uh, uh, I think it is, but by the reality, this is it. When they stood on the day of Pentecost, they spoke with assurance based upon the testimony of God's word. And the reason why they were able to speak with such assurance is because while they were on the earth studying, guess what? Christ was on opening the book for them. Are you with me? So now John is seeing this and John is seeing what's happening in heaven. And they're down on the earth. They're studying the word of God. And, and, and again, we could be led to believe that we're smart. We could be led to believe like, wow, this is powerful, but not realizing that there was somebody that prevailed to open the book for us. Because the Bible says all scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God and is profitable for what? For teaching, for doctrine, right? For teaching, right? So the mere fact that you and I could teach the word of God is because of the inspiration that God gives because Christ has opened the book for us. This is why we are taught that we should never open the Bible without prayer. This is why we are told that the attitude that we assume when we come to the scriptures will determine the interpreter of it. Did you hear what I said? The attitude that we assume when we come to the word of God will determine who interprets it for us. 
Because the Bible says the devils believe and tremble. So Satan will help you study the Bible. You can go to any institution in America. I don't care how pagan it is. And guess what? They have a religious class. And you can get a religious degree from any secular institution. And so there are people who have the Bible and still preach it like it's not real. Because of the interpreter that is interpreting the scriptures for them. So this is something that this scene teaches us something about approaching the throne of God. It teaches us who God is. Now, Paul says, I believe it's in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that God dwelleth in light that no man can approach unto. Remember when Moses wanted to behold that glory. He said, Lord, I beseech thee, do what? Show me thy glory. He said, Moses, you can't look on my face. You can't see it. And it's not alone the fact that God wants to be discreet and he wants to be hidden from us. But God, even in our desire to see him, he sees we're not where we ought to be. And he seeks to hide us. So that we don't see something that will cause our destruction. In his mercy, he shields his face from us. But you know, on the day of, on the day of atonement, God would open the veil. Aaron was able to come in and see. Why? Because of the blood. That's why he was able to see. Moses had been encountering God, but Moses had not yet known who God was. Because if you read in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, when Paul is making reference to Exodus 19, it just wasn't the people that was afraid. The Bible says Moses was too. Moses said, I, I was quaking when God showed up. But perfect love will take away all fear. Moses had not yet known God. And God in his mercy said, Moses, you're not ready to see my face. And the Bible says in the book of Numbers, I believe it's chapter 12, that Moses was the meekest man on the planet. Now, God told him to write that. Write that you're the meekest man on the planet. And he wrote it. But the Bible shows us that how do we become meek? Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 30. Christ is meek. We become meek by learning of him. And so here John, in the book of Revelation chapter 4, John is seeing God. We are told in a book called Early, Early Writings, it says, the mystics, it says spiritualism has blinded our minds to think that God is, is, is just some some, some, some ghost-like figure. But when you read throughout the scriptures, the Bible says that God says, I cast all of your sins behind my back, right? God says, uh, uh, your, your sins have hid his face. His hand is not shortened that he cannot, his hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear is heavy that he cannot hear. There's another place where Christ says, I, well, God says, I will not smell in all of your solemn assemblies. So the reality is, is showing us that God has a personage. Uh, you missed it. You know, God can smell, right? You know, God can hear, right? You know, God can see, right? You know, he can touch, right? So that means he got hands. And he calls the earth his what? So that means he has, and the fact that he, God has, he's a real being. But spiritualism, the dark ages robbed the world of the reality of who God is. It robbed the, the planet of the image of God. And so 
Satan, again, we talk about the persecution, but Satan was literally trying to obliterate the knowledge of God out of the earth. And so this is why when the Dark Ages unfolded, one of the greatest mysteries among the churches was, who is Christ? And even to this very day, people are still confused about who is Christ. And yet the Bible reveals Christ. He says, in all of the pages, it testifies of me. So in the Revelation chapter 4, God is revealing himself to his church. He's wanting us to behold the great mystery of redemption that is transpiring for, for, for the human race. And we want, he wants us to understand that all heaven is focused on and, and the only thing they care about is saving us. You know, the Bible says that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Meaning that his only purpose, his only desire, his only thought is about saving you. That's all Jesus thinks about all day long is how can we save and put your name there. That's all he's thinking about. While you're sleeping, he's already planning out your day. How can we save her? How can we save him? And it is constantly being discussed over and over and over and over and over again. We are told in the book early writings under the chapter God's love for man that when we wander out of the path, an angel is dispatched to heaven. And our case is brought before the heavenly host. And we are told that a stronger angel is sent to keep us till more light can come. Even when we're doing something we have no business doing, God sends more help for us. Amen. We are told that we, when, 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 when we give our hearts to Christ and when we're in positions where we are going to bring a wrong influence over the, over the uh, of reproach upon God's word, it is said that God will, that angels will choose our words for us. They will put thoughts into our minds. This is all God is thinking about every single day is how can I save humanity? God is not slack concerning his promise, but he is what? Long suffering to us word, not willing that. Now think about that brothers and sisters. Let, let it go outside of this room. And let us think about the worst person that we have read about this week in the paper. And know that God is not willing that any should perish. How many times have you read through the, through the Gospels and have read about people that you would not have associated with? Think about it. The, the leper. The leper had a camp that they had to be in. Lepers had to walk and pronounce and had to scream unclean because it was contagious. The, uh, all of the generally the people that Christ healed, the prostitutes, the, 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 the and, and again, we have, we, have, we have sophisticated these sins today. But the reality of it is, these are the people that Jesus was trying to save. To let us know that no matter how low that we have sunken in life and vice to where we're in a cave, naked, cutting, screaming, crying, all the abuses that, that, that we may not put them in a cave today. We may put them in a sane asylums and we may lock them up and do things with them. But these are the very people that Jesus is traveling the world to save. Where the disciples are running away from them. The disciples are trying to get away from these type of people. The, the disciples are trying to build churches away from these type of communities, but not Christ. Christ was where the people were. But this, but God is giving us this knowledge of the throne, not for our own benefit. But he's giving this for the benefit of being able to go back to those who need to hear it. Look at Revelation 4. Look at Revelation 4. Look at Revelation chapter 4, right? The Bible tells us that there was one that sat upon the throne. Notice what it says in verse 3. It says, and he that sat 
was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a what? Rainbow. Rainbow round about the throne in the sight, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders. Sitting, they were clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And then the Bible says, out of the throne proceeded these, these lightnings and these thunderings. And it says, and there were seven lamps of fire, where? Burning where? Before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Question, in heaven, where are they? Where's this scene taking place? In the sanctuary... Where in the sanctuary? How do you know it's in the holy place? Because of the lamps. The lamps indicates to us, as we begin, we said the furniture shows us where we are in the procession of the plan of salvation. When we look at the earthly sanctuary, God gives us a pattern of what is transpiring in the heavens. And so now what we see is we see around this throne and it's before these lamps, it tells us we're in the holy place. It's in the holy place. Now, I want us to notice the Bible says round about this throne what was it? It was a rainbow. The very first time a rainbow is shown to us is in the book of Genesis. After the ark. When they came out of the ark into the new earth God had made a promise to Noah and to his seed that he was not going to destroy the earth. He told them in chapter 8 that seed time and harvest, summer, winter, cold and heat is not going to depart. But I'm sure naturally you hear thunder because that, that's a part of life now. The atmosphere, everything up surrounding the earth has changed. The, the topography, everything, landscape, everything is just completely disoriented now because of the flood. So I'm sure that when they saw clouds, they would wonder, Lord, did you do something? They would start sacrificing and confessing. But God says, I'm going to put this rainbow here so that when you see it, you will look upon it. And you will remember the words, remember the covenant that I'm making with you. That I'm not going to destroy the earth with a flood. And so what we're seeing that round about the throne is we're seeing a covenant of peace with God. But we're also noticing something, his throne. Notice what the Bible says. Go to Psalms 89. Go to Psalms 89. Psalms 89. And we're looking at verse 14. Are we still together? Notice what the Bible says, Psalms 89, and we're looking at verse 14. As we're, as we're looking upon this scene in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, this, this wonderful scene of the plan of salvation and how it is being meted out to those of us here upon the earth. The Bible says in Revelation, in Psalms 89, in verse 14, the Bible says... Psalms 89, verse 14, it says what? Justice and what? Judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. This is what we're seeing when we're looking at Christ the Father sitting upon the throne. And we see this rainbow, this covenant of peace. And we see this throne of justice and judgment. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, go with me to Romans, chapter 3, Romans, the third chapter, and notice what the Word of God tells us here, Romans, chapter 3. The gospel is being explained to us as we're looking at this scene. The love of God and the work of our salvation is being explained to us. Now, it's one thing if... Someone comes to help you. You know, here you are, you, you find yourself in a problem, you're in an accident or whatever the case may be, there's, a, there's something and you need some attention, and one person shows up. You're grateful. But then all of a sudden, a crowd of people show up. 
not just to stand by and look, but everybody has something to offer. Everybody has something to do. It gives you a sense of, of, of comfort, but it also makes you grateful for the extra help that has come. Are we together? It is awaken a sense, it awakens a sense of gratitude. And all of a sudden, again, one person helping you, you're grateful for that, but all of a sudden, people, other people coming. And other people showing up, and, and everybody's doing what they can to, to move your car to the ditch. Everyone is doing what they can to, to somewhat help you and re, re, rehabilitate you. And you're like, man, you're just, you're just grateful for all the attention, and you're overwhelmed with emotion. You don't know how to say thank you. You're just there, and you're just like, man, I just, and everybody's stepping in and saying, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Not what can I get? What can I do? You're overwhelmed with a sense of emotion. And this is what God is showing us in Revelation 4 and 5. It should cause us to be overwhelmed with a sense of emotion. Why? Because all heaven wants to save us. From the least to the greatest, they all have one thing in mind, brothers and sisters, we are told that when man fell, that angels wanted to die for us. Angels, the Bible says, minister to us. They are there, they're ministering spirits sent forth, the Bible says, to minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation. Christ went back to heaven with an expectancy to see us. I'm going to do what? Prepare a place for you. Has someone ever told you they were coming to your house before and you started making preparations for them? You said, you, said, you know what? I'm not going to give them these old towels. Let me go and get me some new ones. I'm not telling anybody to do anything, but I ain't going to put them on these new towels. And, you know, the husband is like, man, they, they, I use them. I ain't giving them these towels. And they take these towels, and the wife takes the towels and throw them away. No, we ain't giving them no. And next thing you know, pull out the good towels. Stop pulling out good dishes. And you looking around like, well, what's all this? I've been eating with paper plates all week. <laughs> People are coming to the house now. People are vacuuming, doing, getting everything ready. There's an anticipation. But all of a sudden, they don't come. What happens? There's a letdown, right? Seem like there's this, this, this. It's like, ooh, it leaves because you were so anticipating of coming. And when they tell you don't come, even on the phone, there's like, it's okay, but you know they're, 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 they're let down that you're not going to make it because there was a great anticipation. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus went to heaven, he wasn't just talking to the disciples, I'm preparing a place for you. It was to be etched upon paper parchment so that you and I could read it. So that you and I could understand that God has literally made room for you and me. Another place was made at the table. It was, you know, like a table that could seat four people and you just put that leaf in the middle and you extend it. Now it could seat eight. And so Jesus says, listen, I'm going to extend the table. I'm literally making a place for you. And a new place is put there and a new tablecloth and a new, everything is prepared and there's your seat. There's great anticipation with everyone at the table who is coming. And guess what? We don't make it. We don't make it because of what? We lose out on it because of what? Brothers and sisters, this week, my, they, the, we have a little bi, a body book. You know, it breaks down the body. And I, we were looking at a picture, and I said to my kids, I said, do you know what this is? They said, no. I said, this is your skin and your hair follicles magnified. I said, look at that skin. It was all broken up and, and it just, it, 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 it brought uh, like, a, like a thought of nauseousness to look at that, to think that that's your skin. And I said, and it said hair follicles, and I said, on the, and they said, that's the dead skin around the hair follicles. And I said, and we think we're beautiful. I said, we think we're beautiful. 
And this is why Satan tries to get us to cover up our skin. This is why he wants us to paint ourselves up. Because he doesn't want us to see what we're, what's really happening to us. That sin is wasting us away. Wrinkle uh, free skin. All this stuff to try to get away who we really are. Plastic surgery. Pulling back the skin to hide the age. But all the time dying inside. And this is who we really are. And this is what we're going to miss out on heaven for. Is for dead skin. This is why we're losing. Because we don't look at these scenes enough. We see what's happening around the White House throne. But we're not looking at this throne. We're not becoming enraptured with the idea that God is still in charge. God still wants to save people. Notice, brothers and sisters, here you are in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Lord have mercy. Romans chapter 3. And notice what it says beginning in verse 21. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. And we're going to read down to verse 20. Six Romans chapter three, verse 21. This is the scene being played out for us. It says, but now the righteousness of God, but now the righteousness of God without the law is what? Manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is what? By faith, faith, the Bible says. Of what? Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have what? Sin. Sin And done what? Come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a what? Propitiation through faith in his blood. That word propitiation means Passover. Now, I want you to notice the scene, brothers and sisters. Here is God's throne, and the habitation of God's throne is what? Justice and what? Judgment. Mercy and truth, we are told, will go before his face. Question. Justice. The law demands the wages of sin is what? Death. That's justice. God's law demands holiness. Righteousness, purity, the violation of that law is death. There's a penalty. But wait a minute. There's a rainbow above the throne, a symbol of mercy, a symbol of a covenant of peace. How can these two things interact with each other? How can justice be met and also mercy and truth be exemplified and don't destroy justice and judgment at the same time. Are we together? Because God's justice must be upheld, but so must his mercy and his truth must also be upheld. Because God is not unbalanced. He is, he does have justice. He is going to uh, exercise judgment. James says we're going to be judged. But how is he also going to exemplify mercy and truth and not destroy his judgment and his justice? Well, the Bible tells us right here, Christ now becomes the propitiation. Christ steps in and is willing to allow your sins to pass over and fall upon himself. He is willing to become our scapegoat in one sense, not the scapegoat in the sense of him being of of of. Of him being like Satan, but Jesus is willing, not scapegoat, the better term is he wants to be our substitute. He wants to be our substitute. So somebody don't take that little part and etch it out and say, Pastor Tinsley called Christ a scapegoat. No. <laughs> Wrong choice of words. Christ wants to be our substitute and our assurance for heaven. So here, round about the throne, John sees a rainbow. Wait a minute. He goes back and he thinks about that rainbow of covenant, that rainbow of mercy. But he also thinks about that throne of justice and judgment. 
How can these two things, which seem so diametrically apart, how can these two actually come together and meet? And the Bible says, kiss each other. How can this go forth? And this is where Christ is seen. This is the plan of salvation being etched out right in front of our faces. We can look to the throne of God and where some may see fear, some may see dread, but those who understand what salvation is, this is why Paul says in Hebrews chapter four, we have a, we have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in how many points? All points. Tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come what? Boldly to the throne of what? Grace. That we may obtain what? Mercy. We can see the rainbow round about the throne. Why? Because we can see it through the eyes of Christ. We can see the plan of redemption. And we don't see an angry father. But we see the father that is standing out, a great, looking at us a great way off waiting to embrace us as the Holy Spirit has been drawing us back to himself. Are we together? So we don't see an angry God, but we understand that his, his, his anger is against sin. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked all day long. God is, is, is he wants to put down sin. But because of the plan of redemption, because we don't come to the throne of grace with, with, with this self-assurance, but we come like the prodigal son, which says, Father, I have what? Sin. But we see the, 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 the rainbow round about the throne. We see the mercy that keeps drawing us back. Because why did the prodigal son want to come home? Why did he want to come back? Huh? He realized that in the father's house, there was mercy. He knew that the, that the least place in his father's house was better than the best place that the world had. But it was because of the love of the father is what drew him back to come home. Not to ignore his sin, but he was willing to acknowledge his sin right before the father's face. Why? Because around about the throne was the rainbow. Are we together? And so now, this is why when you go into chapter 5, you see that lamb coming and standing in the midst of the throne. And the Bible says, as he had been slain. So what is it that brings the mercy? It is Christ, what he did for us on that cross. He it received the judgment and the justice of God. That mercy can be implemented and can be given to any one of us who comes to that throne. Because where's the judgment? It's found with Christ. Where's the judgment? It's found with Christ. Where's his righteousness? It is found with Christ of which we accept. Are we together? Because it's not ours because we've done it. It's ours because we've received it. We live it, we walk it, we breathe it, we pray it, we sing it. Notice what it says. We're closing. Notice what it says. Verse 25, whom God hath set forth, Jesus, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare, watch this, to declare his righteousness for what? For remissions of sins, notice, that are what? Past. Wait a minute. So now you come to this throne where there's justice, where there's judgment, and where this rainbow. But Jesus, you see this rainbow, but Jesus, you see this lamb that has been slain, and you realize that the judgment and the justice that should have been meted out on you, it fell on this lamb that was slain. Are we together? And so now the Father can declare his righteousness for your past life. Are we together? So now your past life. Doesn't reflect. Who you were. It reflects. Who you are now. 
in Christ. Are we together? That's what it reflects. That's what it says. But look what it goes on. It doesn't stop there. It says to declare his righteousness for sins that are passed through the one. Through the forbearance of God, the long suffering of God, the mercy of God. It says for to declare, I say, when at this time, here's what righteousness. Now watch this, that he might be what and what of him, which one. So now how can Jesus, how can God still be just? Because Satan says, you're not right. You have no right to save him. You have no right to save her. But he says, yes, I do have every right to save him. I have every right to save her. Why? Because they accepted Jesus' death in their place. And Jesus' death is credited to their account. So not only has my justice been meted out, but now my mercy can be shown. Because of what they have accepted in my son. Are we together? This is what John sees around the throne. This is very important for John to understand this around the throne. Because when those seals began to open, God does not want John to forget what he saw in heaven. As he's going from a white horse to a red horse to a black horse to a death horse to seeing the souls under the altar to seeing that sixth seal being opened and Christ about to come. John, don't forget what you saw in heaven. Don't allow the, 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 the turmoil, don't allow the strife in the world and in the church to cause you to be, to cause that to eclipse what you saw happening around the throne. So the attention has to be brought back to heaven. Now, brothers and sisters, as we finish, as we look at these seals, and as we look at the trumpets, these three cords, as they will be woven together, are going to start coming and are, start go are going to start coming out in a more vivid reality when you get to Revelation chapter 11 onward. Because all of these events from the churches, the seals and the trumpets, as they are co a cord woven together, they will help us to understand that while we're passing through these scenes that God has shown us who is holding the seven candlesticks. God is showing us who is controlling the course of human events. And when we come to the trumpets, God is going to show you that his intercession is not ceased. Despite what you see transpiring on the world. Why is it, brothers and sisters, that it seems like time continues to go on? Is because God has not ceased his intercession for his people. That the work of redemption has not been forgotten by God. That, he has, that, that God has not stopped holding the seven churches. He still has his work in his hands. Are we together? And this is what God is showing us around the throne. And this is why Paul says you and I can come boldly to the throne of grace. When Paul said to, when Christ said to the woman at the well... He didn't say it as, as an arbitrary, he didn't say it in a way that implied that everyone is experiencing this, but he said something that was interesting to the woman. He says, we know what we worship. He says, we know what we worship. What was he, why was he saying that? Just because he was a Jew? Did the Jews as a whole knew what they were worshiping? No. But he was saying that based upon what God had given them in his word. He says, we know what we worship. We know who we worship. She was asking, where should we go? Jerusalem or should I stay here? He says, salvation is of the Jews. We know what we worship. Can we in this day and age say we know who and where we worship. Do we have that assurance that we know where we are and what God is doing to save not only ourselves, but what God is doing to save others? If someone was to stop us and ask us, what must I do to be saved? What would we tell them? 
what church will we send them to? How could we lead them to the throne of grace if we don't know where it is? Everyone is big on pray to sinner's prayer. Well, all prayers of are sinner's prayers. Every prayer we pray, every prayer we pray is a sinner's prayer. How do we lead people to the throne of God? How will they know that they have re- that they have gotten to the throne of God? You know, Gabriel comes to the house on Wednesday nights. And my wife always says, call when you get home. Call when you get home. And after a while, a text will come through, and she'll say, he made it. He made it. So every night he comes, she says, let me know when you get home. And, and before he leaves, he says, he calls, he calls home and lets them know he's coming home. And then when he gets home, he calls us or texts us and lets us know he's made it. And I say that to say this. We know that he has made it home because he calls us back and he says, I've made it. He knows where home is. If we're leading others to the throne of grace, how will we know that they've gotten there? What will be their experience? What's going to happen when we know that they've gotten to that throne? See, we have put these these outward things on people as a test for, 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 for acceptance with God. But in reality, how do we know that they have gotten to the throne? Wow, they've changed the way they dress. They must have got to the throne. They've changed the way they eat. Man, they got to be at the throne. They've made these outward reforms. And I'm not saying these reforms are not essential, brothers and sisters. They're, they're very essential. That's why God gave them to us. But we can put the cart before the horse. And we're looking at what people are doing outwardly. And we're not understanding where they are and how they've gotten there. Some people will dress a certain way just to come to church. And then you see them through the midst of the week. And it's totally different. So the reality is, how do we know that people have gotten to the throne? Something has to happen. It's not guesswork. How do we know the prodigal son got to the throne? There was a change that took place. When he got to the throne, there was a change. The Bible says, uh uh-uh, when we get to the throne, there's rejoicing in heaven. When there's repentance, we have come to the throne of grace. We have obtained that mercy. We find help in our time of need. Guess what? In heaven, there's rejoicing. Every time someone comes, guess what? That, 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 that whole scene starts again. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. They're not seeing that just for the sake of saying it. They're seeing it because of redemption. This is what prompts that, that cry. It's redemption. So why are they saying it day and night? Guess what, brothers and sisters? Because day and night somebody is coming. Somebody today has made it to the throne of God. Have we made it? We made it to church, but have we got to the throne? We made it. Made it to church. Praise God. We're here. We're on live stream, but have we gotten to his throne?